Put it this way, I only got a 34 inch waistline. I don't have a huge butt. But it's still, you know, not big enough. I sat there, unscrewed the thing, took the thing out, and your mother said, you know, the, you don't own that car yet. And I, I said, I'll put the seat back in later. But that was it. Um, why do you think they, they, they went to the they went to the straight seats and the back seats and the bucket seats. Oh, that makes it easier. Yeah, because they all of a sudden figured you can't put those bucket seats in the back car for fancy stuff because you got an awful lot of broad beam children. Well, part of it is people especially realize because if you go onto an airplane, unless you're in first class, right, or yep. business class, but regular class, all the seats are the same. And they don't fit right. I mean, I can, like my youngest, you know, my youngest was a good sight, but. She was flying from a young age. She basically sitting there, and you know the seatbelt didn't fight tight, tight, tight fast enough because one size the seatbelts don't fit all. So I'm sitting there, holding, you know, when we're taking off, you know, and the, and the tourist says, "Is that seatbelt fastened?" And yes. And I'm, I'm sitting there tight with my hand. I've got the seatbelt tight, and so it looks like it tight across this roster. And basically, there was a huge room because they aren't designed for, for, you know, 40 pounders. Then the, you know that basically what happens if you're too small for if you're too big for the for the um, you know seat the seat belt. I mean, if you're too big for a seat that you put in the, the child seat, they're not designed for that. They don't understand that there are bigger kids, mm -hmm. and there's somewhere between the bigger kid and the seat run fit. There's a problem. Uh, park rides are the same thing. People fall, kids fall out of park rides continually because the belts are not designed for one size. Well, think of like when you go to Disneyland or the other amusement parks. They don't always even have seat belts, and sometimes it's just a bar. And the bar doesn't work if you're not the right size. Mm -hmm. That's, That's why they have height requirements. Height requirements, but the height requirement doesn't matter if you tend to be uh, really thin, really or, thin or over or overweight. And a lot of people, we have two extremes in this country. Overly thin or overly heavy. If you're overly heavy, they can't. It doesn't snap into place right. And if you're overly heavy, they don't notice it. I um, we went to a thing was a while ago, where the people you know where they pull the thing down so they could go into the ride, and the ride didn't click. I mean, it didn't click. I, I could tell because there's they're you know they're on the, I'm we're on one side, they're on the back side. Ours clicked in, theirs didn't click in, and. Um, uh, and basically, you can sit there and hear the people, thing not fast, and thing not fast, and thing not fast, and kid, thing not fast, all through the ride, things not fastened. And then they got back and they complained, you know, the thing, because they're moving the thing up and down on the other side of us, and they said, well, that's not supposed to be. The kid didn't fit the seat. Okay. One size does not fit all. I mean, I'm a male, my stuff doesn't fit her. She's a female, her stuff doesn't fit me. But, uh, even in Russia, one size didn't fit all. I mean, they had to make different size clothes, even though they only had one color gray for a long time. They still made different. They made different size sack outfits. Yeah, but see, part of it is the government's trying to do the one size fit all when it comes to health care. Yeah. They also have this one size fit all mentality when it comes to uh, taxes. Ta taxes. I mean, and you're probably thinking, well, how can one size fit all? It's like a certain type. You hit a certain, you know, whatever barometer income. And you should be paying a certain amount of taxes. Well, but the problem is, is that she came from a family business, and my family were were old world German, and and Irish. We basically everybody put the money in the same pot, because that's how you made certain at the end of the month you actually pay all the bills. Because uh, and then when the kids are going to college, it basically messes the pot up a bit. But. Um, it just and, and then you have arrogance of a lot of people. Even the president of the United States is arrogance. Well, we need they need to do something about the way they file their income taxes because if they file their income taxes properly, you they wouldn't have this problem. Well, they don't have great. They don't you know. Okay, like he should. Nobody in his administration pays taxes, so they don't know what it's like to go pay taxes. You know, so they they don't. They don't understand that the average person doesn't have an accountant to do their taxes for them. Well, you know, here's part of the reason is the president may actually think that 200000 goes a lot further than it does because he was a professor. Yeah, but he was all, okay, you want to go to Homeby Hills and see how professors live, folks? You want to go around the colleges in Chicago and see how the professors live? You want to go to Columbia University and see the places the college professors live? They live quite well. 
So he knows to live that, you know, he knows that basically, he doesn't call himself rich because he lived in an area of expensive homes, and a lot of his money and his wife's money paid, had to go to pay for the living and where they were at. So I was just a college professor, and my wife was nothing more than, a, you know, working, you know, as a hospital administrator. Yeah, but they're making like about four or five hundred thousand bucks a year, and multiply that for about fifteen years, folks. The guy was a millionaire by any stretch of the standards. He's always been a mil he's been a millionaire since he was in his thirties. Okay. He's lived in a house that's uh, okay. This this place here is a million dollar place in Los Angeles. He lived in a place that was a two million dollar place. Anywhere in the world, okay. here would be. Five, six million dollars if you could get into it. We were in a place the other day in Holmby Hills that basically three million dollars, the place that. It's you know, kind of a, yeah, basically. It's like it's always been a rental. It's always been a rental, you know. We're not, it's a nice place. I've got, I've got a view like it's got the million dollar view, folks. You go out that, you look out through that back and you say, wow, this is why they paid for this. But in Los Angeles, that's considered to be a normal teacher's home in Los Angeles. That is a normal home for a college See, professor. now if I knew what I knew then, I'd probably be a college professor. Yeah. Well, so. well, because I always thought, well, they didn't make that much money, but see, they also don't pay the same taxes that everybody does. I know. They also get a lot more extra deductions for things, too. But that's, okay, um, if, if you work on the one-size-fits-all, basically college professors are multimillionaires. And they're going to, he's going to hit the union people. We've got to live one size fits all. Well, um, aren't there a lot of union people? Oh, that make union people. A year? Yeah, a lot of union people, you know, uh, make that kind of money. If you figure in their overtime, I know police officers. I, I, I forgot how to say. My father knew police officers 50 years ago that were making three to four hundred thousand dollars a year. Wow. Yeah, and it was all it was, and they weren't they weren't breaking any laws. They just did an awful basically. If somebody wanted to do something, they'd take their time and then they'd get overtime for it. Because the rules were you can't get overtime. I mean, you can't work for the same hour. And so the guys say, you know, they'd make deals. You know, they, we have to have X amount of officers on the street at all times. Those are the rules. And if somebody couldn't do it, they had to call in a person on his overtime. And my father knew people that always, basically, they were single and basically they didn't have any life and they like wearing a uniform, so they take all the overtime hours they could get. And these are guys, um, uh, anybody remember, um, um, you know, uh, Larry Wilcox, is an Eric Estrada series ship? Anybody remember that Larry Estrada, I mean, Eric Estrada had an unbelievable apartment, he had a boat, had a fancy car, he was single and taking all the hours he could get. That's how, and you call a police officer, oh, I know a fire captain, a, a fire captain, um, I, mean, I went, actually his, they own, uh, I can't tell you the name, but they, they basically for, since I was a kid, they've also owned um, a car, you know, where they, they, they do, they build hot rods and stuff for people. He, he was making four to five hundred thousand dollars a year for the Los Angeles Fire Department way back then. Really? Back. Yeah, because... Uh, he needed the money because his, his basically the car business didn't make any money. Him and his sons and his father ran it. And his sons were little kids and his father was, you know, a World War I project. So he basically, he would, they, they, you know, they would be like 48 hours, 48 hours off. He would do 48 hours, 48 hours, and oh. one day off and then 48 hours. Because he, um, it, he needed the money, so he was racking up. He would be captains at... You know, it, 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 not against the law. Well, they just have a manager. They have to have this, this, and this. And if they don't have this, this, and this, they take the people at the top of the list. They knew he he would come in, and his wife didn't object because his wife was a pencil pusher. She need, you know, you want to run this business that doesn't make any money, you've got to go out and work. He was not a millionaire. This is a guy who was a fire captain, worked on automobiles, had the American dream. Well, we'll put it this way. Uh, this is 2010. I met the family when we were playing, in the, you know, 60 years ago. Oh, really? The business still exists 60 years later, so you don't think the work that the guy put in paid off? 60 years later, they're still building custom automobiles for people. Wow. You know, and they've got a parts business besides, you know, 
but um, it, it works. It, that is the American dream. You can make as much as you want to make in this country if you're willing to work for it. I mean, one site doesn't fit all in the entertainment business. We know people that are massively capitalized that can't do anything. We know people that have nothing that have everything. You know, but I mean, well, I mean, she can tell you she's the business side of everything. She, her, you know, mine is all entertainment and stuff, but she has all the business degrees. So I, I'm the pencil pusher when it comes to the. I, I know that you got to do this, do that, and do that. But she is the pencil pusher when it comes to business. She can tell you that business one size does not fit all. She, she's got a long history. She's also been an intern for the Congress. She knows. <laughs> she can probably tell you nightmare stories about one size not fitting all. Mm -hmm. But part of it is people try to make it fit regardless. Yeah, you can't put a, uh, a round peg in a square hole. Yeah, so it's harder again even putting a square in a round hole. Yeah. But well, depending on the squares and the rounds. You can't put a triangle into a round hole. It's, it, it's things that cannot be done. But the, the Democratic Party has based everything on one size fits all. I, you know, like I said, you know, I can imagine my youngest, you know, my God, Daddy was a billionaire. If we'd have known that, we'd have spent more money. I spent enough. You know, and she, you know, she didn't realize until just a few months ago. Or late, actually, probably a month ago, that her father was a millionaire all his life, mm -hmm. and didn't realize it. He would just ran a little family grocery store, where the family, where the money was all done. Where Obama is saying, "Well, they should learn to fire their taxes like regular people." Uh, yeah, they are regular people. That is, they yeah. said uh, more than 4.7 billion businesses in this country. Our own, this is the statistics that they'll tell you. More 4.7 million businesses country jointly file income tax forms, personal and business, together. Oh, they do? Yeah. That's Those a lot. usually small businesses. Yeah, that's small yeah. businesses. They do that because they don't have accountants. And because they... Or even if they do have accountants, they do that. It's just my... Because part of it is if you separate it, there's another level of taxes. That's right. It just, it, it was cheaper, you know... My mother, my mother was a like my mother was secondary treasurer of a large corporation. My mother, my mother worked her way up. My mother in the recognition, she worked her way up from a, you know running around a drive-in with a little cute skirt and, <laughs> and on her on her little roller skates and became the secretary treasurer of a major corporation. But my mother was simply she'd do this. She you know she juggled the books because if you you're doing housing. You don't because there are cycles, which she's finding out because she's a she's an architectural photographer. That there are times that are really hot to photograph architecture for sale, and then there are times that are not. Right now, the time is getting hot again. But my mother, we would set with two or three places on the on the books all at once, and you sit there and take the money. My father, my father was a reserve police officer. He sold for Canada Dry, and he worked for Federal Mogul. And he was a performer in the business. He's working four jobs to afford building houses. Wow. Which basically, you know, uh, my mother didn't object to because we moved from one good house to another all the time. We had a lot of good houses, by the way. We had crappy houses, we had good ones. But um, uh, so she's seen some of the good, she's seen some of the crappy in her wife's family. But um, she would juggle the stuff. You know, she, my father, she'd say, well, you know, something like, you know, you're going to have to put on, you're going to have to go. My father was, my father sold ice cream to Eskimos. He participated in a contest for Canada Dry. The, you know, the first person that can sell frozen thing to, you know, such such will get a trip to Hawaii. That's how we made our first trip to Hawaii ever. My father took his, his Canada Dry truck from, basically his, his route was from here to Denver to Kansas City and back, which is a hell of a long route. It's a really long route. But, uh, yeah, it's a really, really wrong route, but he basically he bypassed Denver and went to Alaska. <laughs> and he, he so he was one of the first he was the first people person to sell ice cream to Eskimos, and it was the most simple thing in the world to sell because he took he, he, he thought it was going to be a big joke, but you know because he knew he could put you know he could he could come back to his regular because they were bored they probably made ice they cheese. they they made ice they took ice frozen ice and they put stuff you know they put on snow 